On this channel, we've covered our fair share of crazy exes and relationships gone wrong. But the case we're covering today is totally nuts for one reason. The casualty in this situation actually forgave the woman that tried to take his life, even after she became an online sensation. Let's dive in. Little is known about Yuka Takaoka before this terrible event took place, except how she got into working as a hostess. According to reports, she dropped out of college to pursue a career in one of Japan's many hostess clubs. Hostess clubs are a popular spot for men to hang out and unwind after a day at the office. The hostesses pour drinks, light cigarettes, and flirt with their patrons. The idea is that they provide some PG companionship and there are often rules against touching the hostesses or contacting them outside of work. In recent years, host clubs have started to take off too, as much more and more women in Japan join the workforce. These are pretty much the same as hostess clubs, except the employees are men that cater to women. This was how Yuka met a man named Phoenix Luna. Yuka was a manager at her club in October 2018 when she started going to the host club nearby, where she met Phoenix, an employee at the club. What we know of Phoenix is that he had a pretty hard start in life. He reportedly has at least five siblings, but he lost contact with them at a young age. After his parents broke up, the whole family fell apart, and he was put into foster care. He stayed in the system until he finished middle school. After that, he went to work in construction, but found it wasn't the career for him. As he tried to find his way in the world, Phoenix ran out of cash and ended up homeless for a little while, until he got his job at the club. It's kind of unclear how their relationship evolved from there, but there's one thing for certain. She liked him more than he liked her. Phoenix was pretty popular at the club. He was the fourth most popular host in the whole place. If business was good, he would be second or third. This meant he had a lot of ladies coming to see him specifically, and one of those was Yuka. Reports of how the two got to know each other differ. Some say they had mutual interest in each other, so they started texting and hanging out outside of the club. Others say that she bought out all of his time, over $9,000 a month, so he had to spend time with her and only her. This was later confirmed, and Yuka's decision to do this automatically made Phoenix the most popular host in May 2019. Whatever happened, Yuka was really into Phoenix and tried to find ways to get him to hang out with her outside the club. She frequently invited him out to the movies and cat cafes, and Phoenix often agreed to the dates as he saw her as a good girl. But as time went on, it became obvious that things were far from perfect. Yuka had a severe jealousy problem when it came to Phoenix's job, which is pretty hypocritical when she was in literally the same field as him. She would get upset any time a visitor to his club spoke to him and made a habit of just hanging out there all the time. She would also check his phone behind his back, looking for any sign that he was being unfaithful to her. And unfortunately for him, she found evidence of just that. Well, not really evidence that he was cheating, but enough to make Yuka suspect he was seeing other people behind her back. A photo of him with another woman. This could mean a bunch of things. Sure, he totally could have been seeing another woman behind Yuka's back, but did she somehow forget what his job was? More than likely, this was just a picture of him with a client. Except Yuka sure didn't see it that way. It's thought that around the time she found the pictures was when she began planning not only Phoenix's death, but her own. I thought I would kill him because I thought that was how I could be with him. I thought that expressions such as I like you and I would like to be with you would become a reality if we both die. On May 23rd, 2019, Phoenix, totally oblivious to what Yuka was planning, agreed to go to her apartment to help her clean and organize her things. However, he got held up at work and didn't get to her apartment until pretty late at night. Yuka claims that when he arrived, Phoenix was being cold and standoffish, probably because she'd confronted him recently about the photos on his phone. He asked her if he could take a bath to relax after a long day, and she said yes. Phoenix ended up falling asleep in the tub for a while, and after he woke up and got out, Yuka was supposedly asleep in bed. He too got in bed and went back to sleep pretty much straight away, totally exhausted. A while later, he woke up again, this time because of an uncomfortable feeling in his stomach. When he opened his eyes, he saw Yuka kneeling over him with a knife in his stomach. Phoenix was so in shock that he couldn't even feel the pain from his injury. Instead, he just panicked and tried to flee from the apartment. He managed to push Yuka off the bed and started running for the door. 
She caught up with Phoenix and tried to stop him from leaving, but Phoenix was bigger and stronger and managed to keep Yuka from striking him with the knife again. Eventually, he made it to the elevator and managed to get inside without Yuka trapping herself in there with him. Phoenix rode down to the lobby where he was sure he'd be able to make his escape and find help. However, he'd lost a lot of blood and adrenaline and could only keep him going for so long. He only managed to take a couple of steps into the lobby before he collapsed and Yuka caught up with him. After noticing what was going on, either someone working in the apartment complex or another tenant called the police who raced to the scene. When they got there, they saw Phoenix lying on the floor covered in blood and Yuka sitting next to him. A photo taken at the scene of Yuka talking to a friend on the phone and smoking a cigarette went viral soon after the case made the news, as people were so confused by how calm she looked after what she'd done. Phoenix was taken straight to the hospital and Yuka was arrested. She didn't put up any kind of fight and went with the officers peacefully. Footage taken not long after her arrest shows her smiling in the back of the police car. It's almost like she had no idea she did anything wrong. A lot of disturbing evidence was found in Yuka's apartment. According to reports, the police discovered a diary with pages written in blood saying things like, I like you and I love you so much I want to kill you. They also discovered a note written on her phone, giving us an insight into her mind. I want to be a tragic heroine. How is it possible for him to look at a woman other than me? I know killing him is for the best. She was charged with attempted homicide and was looking at about 10 years behind bars. And yes, you heard that right, attempted homicide. Amazingly, Phoenix survived the ordeal and responded well to the treatment in the hospital. However, even though he was healing well physically, his mental state definitely took a toll. For weeks after, he would experience panic attacks and be unable to sleep due to fear that someone would try to kill him again. Phoenix's liver was badly damaged, which meant it was unlikely he'd be able to drink again, since without a fully functioning liver, the body struggles to process ethanol. When some of his co-workers came to visit, they said they would drink for him on his behalf. He was so traumatized that he even considered quitting his job for a quieter life. After some thought, he decided against this and continues to work as a host to this day. I had nowhere else to go other than back here. I felt like my family was actually made up of the elder hosts at the club. While Phoenix was in the hospital, Yuka was getting an unexpected amount of attention. After her photo and the footage of her smiling made the news, media outlets all over the world became fascinated by this strange woman. A lot of people were saying that she was far too pretty to be a killer, and even started petitions to have her charges dropped. It was like she built up some fan base for her crime, who would draw fan art of her and comment flattering things on her social media accounts. Some started calling her the real-life Yandere. Yandere is a term for a character, usually a girl in anime who is overly lovesick. They are obsessively in love with another character to the point where they start to go crazy and go from sweet and loving to psychotic. You're certifiably out of your mind. If anything, this just made her more popular. She was being talked about on Twitter and being likened to a character in anime, forgetting that there was somebody who got seriously hurt and almost lost their life. Some fans even asked the creators of the video game Yandere Simulator to make a skin resembling Yuka. This, to me, is way over the line. Not only does it glorify what Yuka did to Phoenix, but it promotes the dangerous reality of stalking as something romantic. Even in 2021, stalking isn't taken seriously. Many think it just means following someone around obsessively, but Yuka's constant schemes to get to Phoenix to pay attention to her, as well as her idea of, if I can't have him, no one will, definitely qualifies. Even though it's a crime in all 50 U.S. states, less than one-third of states classify stalking as a felony if it's a first offense, leaving victims without protection or justice from the law. In December 2019, Yuka went to trial and was found guilty of attempted homicide. Phoenix actually appeared at the trial to give an impact statement, and what he had to say was pretty surprising. He told the court he doesn't hold a grudge of any bad feelings towards Yuka, despite what she did. He said that in some ways his life was better now. His fame meant he was making more money at work and had allowed him to reunite with two of his siblings. He asked the judge to give Yuka a lesser sentence so that she would have a chance to live a normal life. She was sentenced to three and a half years behind bars and was ordered to pay five million to Phoenix. 
Since this happened in 2019, that means she'll probably be let back out into the free world within months of this video going up. Even now, people are interacting with her social media accounts, praising her and hating on her. It'll be interesting to see how she'll react, if at all, to all of this weird attention after she gets out. More than anything, I hope Phoenix continues to enjoy his life and live without fear of something this awful happening to him again. I think it takes a cold-blooded person and holding a baby. I think you went in there, I'm gonna take care of this situation. I'm gonna take care of people messing with you now. People ain't gonna mess with my girl no more. She's not my girl. You may say that out loud, but you know in your heart to do. What were the rules? Don't be out past, you know, 12 o'clock at night. No smoking, no drinking, no partying, stuff like that. This is Janelle Porter. She might look and sound all sweet and innocent, but she's far from that. In 2012, she made her parents and boyfriend commit the most horrifying crime, but the method she used to convince them will leave you speechless. Let's take a look at the wild case of Janelle Porter, the insecure catfish that killed her lover's family. Janelle Lee Potter was born in 1981 to Marvin and Barbara Potter. Marvin, who is popularly known as Buddy, was a former Marine who served in Vietnam and reportedly also worked with the CIA, while Barbara was working with the multinational Hewlett Packard Company. Janelle had an older sister, Christy, and the two were raised in Pennsylvania before eventually moving to Mountain City, Tennessee in 2005. Growing up, Janelle was kind of a weird kid who had trouble making friends and suffered from multiple health issues, including type 1 diabetes. This made her parents super overprotective of her and would not let her out of their sight. What kind of person is she? good-natured, sweet person. She's not an angry person. Naive, young, innocent? Yes, very naive. She's young in her mind, more young than her age. Janelle's sister, Christy, who's been estranged from the family, said in an interview their parents exaggerated Janelle's health and learning problems. Instead of being herself, my parents tried to make her fit in. They also, in the same breath, would say how different she was, and then she became unable to make friends normally. So by the time she was 30, Janelle was still living and depending on her parents, who still kept a tight leash on her. She could not get a job, drive, or even have a boyfriend. What were the rules? Don't be out past, you know, 12 o'clock at night. No smoking, no drinking, no partying, stuff like that. Janelle also didn't have friends and spent most of her time on social media trying to make a connection with random people. She was particularly very active on Facebook, where her profile read, I'm a very sweet, caring person, I love life, and I love to make others laugh. Not surprisingly, Janelle's parents also had access to this. Did your parents have access to your Facebook page? Do they monitor yes. it? Yes. A woman in your late 20s and your parents have access to your Facebook page? Well. At one time, Janelle did manage to make one friend, a local pharmacy clerk by the name of Tracy Greenwell. We felt sorry for Janelle. She was sheltered and sick and stuff. She gave me her phone number and I started calling her. The two became fast friends and started hanging out. Tracy would even introduce her to some of her other friends, including her brother, 36-year-old Billy Payne. Now, Janelle had a life and friends and was no longer spending most of her life on the computer. She was going to the mall and doing fun outdoor activities like rock climbing. She had reportedly even started developing a crush on Tracy's brother, Billy. Did you ever get the impression that maybe she liked Billy? That's what the, everybody says. She fell in love with Bill, but I didn't, I still don't say it like that. The problem was Billy was already in a relationship with his long-term girlfriend, 23-year-old Billy Jean. The two were even living together and had a seven-month-old child, Tyler. Tracy would introduce Janelle to her cousin, Jamie Curd, and the two would quickly start dating. Now, remember, though she was an adult, Janelle wasn't allowed to have a boyfriend, so her relationship with Jamie had to be kept under wraps. But since Jamie was handy with computers, Janelle's parents would often invite him over to the house to fix the family computer, and the two lovebirds would then get a chance to see each other. They would also secretly see each other outside the house with Jamie even buying Janelle a phone so they could communicate without the parents knowing. But despite her relationship with Jamie, Janelle was still pining for Billy, and this would make her do something completely unthinkable. Although Janelle's social life seemed to be going great, her Facebook page was not. She had started receiving mean comments and messages from anonymous trolls who even threatened to 
customer. What kinds of things were people saying about you? Just that I was a bad person, I was horrible, threatened to get right. Must have been pretty scary. Yes. Obviously terrified, Janelle went and told her mom about it, who then tried to get the cyber bullies to stop harassing her daughter. I remember I wrote, please do not write on Janelle's Facebook. I begged them, please don't do this. When asked who she thought was behind the mean posts, Janelle did not hesitate to mention Billie Jean. Yeah, the same Billie Jean who was in a long-term relationship with Billie Payne. Turns out, Janelle didn't like her. Oh, she hated her. From the get-go. Mm -hmm. She'd call her all kinds of bad names. According to Janelle, Billie Jean was jealous of her because she was pretty and could take away her boyfriend, Billie Payne. And that's why she wrote those comments on her Facebook. What? Clearly, the only one jealous here is Janelle. She even went as far as wishing death on Billie Jean and her young family. That she wished that Bill and Billie Jean and that damn baby would die. This started a major online feud with Janelle and her boyfriend Jamie on one side and Bill and Billie Jean on the other. Keep in mind that Jamie was Bill's cousin, so he actually took Janelle's side over his family. Janelle all along insisted that she was the real victim. She was always saying that somebody was mad at her, somebody hated her, somebody wanted to kill her. Soon, these virtual feuds started to spill over into the real world. And they're trying to set me up, but I don't like this because I very sick. They were wanting to blow up my dad's truck throwing rocks at the house. One time, Janelle's mom called the police after a rock bearing Billy and Billie Jean's names appeared in their front yard. After this incident, both couples unfriended each other on Facebook. But instead of going their separate ways and moving on with their lives, one of the couples would make some drastic measures that would leave the whole town reeling with shock. County On January 31st, 2012, at around 10.30 a.m., a friend of Bill and Billie Jean decided to drop by the couple's house to check on them. But what she found left her completely traumatized. There's a baby involved. He don't look right. Bill and Billie Jean were found dead in their home with single bullet wounds to their heads. Bill was lying in bed and also had his throat cut, while Billie Jean was on the floor in the nursery, still holding her baby. He's in one room, she's in the other, right? Sleeping. It kind of looks like she's trying to get to her baby. They can tell I was down. Their faces are swelled. They're black and blue. They've been. Thankfully, the seven month old baby was unharmed. But what kind of monster would gun down someone holding a baby? I think it takes cold blooded person she by holding a baby. This scene was clean to clean. There were no shell casings, no fingerprints, no DNA, nothing. It was clear to the police that the killer was a professional. It looked like a hit. Like a contract hit. Right. But why would someone put a hit on this young couple? Being a small town, everyone knew that the only person who had issues with the couple was none other than Janelle. So officers went to the Potter's home to interview Janelle and her parents. With the Tennessee oh, okay. nice to meet you. What we're doing right now is investigating the double homes. Mm -hmm. Very serious matter. From the onset, Janelle's dad started getting defensive. Everybody always points favor. That's for sure. Oh, no, there ain't nobody pointing yeah. their finger. Janelle was sympathetic about the saying she didn't want any harm to come to the young family. Do you know of anybody that would hurt them, want to hurt them? No, actually, I don't. I feel bad about the situation because I didn't want no harm on them. Notice how sweet and innocent Janelle sounds? If investigators didn't know better, they would have actually believed her. She went on to make herself appear to be the victim as she described how the couple had been harassing her. They've been harassing me in my driveway, on our property. And then yesterday morning when I got on Facebook is when I found out. And um, I mean, I'm sorry it happened, but I mean, that's all I could tell you is they, they have been harassing the living crap out of me. Why would they be harassing? It came out to be a jealousy thing. They said I was too pretty. And then investigators asked her about her relationship with Jamie Curd. Yep, she thought no one knew about that. It's Jamie. He's just a friend. We've been friends for years. He's friend about that. Yeah. He's friend all of us. Looks like her parents are still clueless about the true nature of Janelle and Jamie's relationship. Jamie sound like your boyfriend? No. He's just a really good friend. 
Does he want to be your boyfriend? But the detectives were not as easily fooled and decided to bring Jamie in for questioning to see if he knew something about the murders. Jamie denied knowing anything about who killed Bill and Billie Jean, but when a polygraph was taken, he failed. What was he hiding? Could he be the killer? I think you went in there. I'm gonna take care of this situation. I'm gonna take care of people messing with you now. People ain't gonna mess with my girl no more. She's not my girl. You may say that out loud, but you know what your heart to do. At this point, investigators thought that they had their guy. But then, Jamie would say something that would bring a completely new and bizarre twist to the case that shocked even the investigators. Is the CIA here? CIA? No. No. Why would Jamie ask such a strange question? The detectives were curious to find out. Uh, why did you ask about the CIA? Because uh, he uh, says he works for them. Turns out, Jamie had been texting with a man named Chris, who told him that he worked for the CIA and that it was his job to protect Janelle from her enemies. Why would the CIA be concerned about Janelle or who she was feuding with? It just didn't make any sense. As investigators continued to press him for answers, Jamie finally broke and told them that he and Janelle's dad, Buddy, were the ones who killed Bill and Billie Jean. Buddy pulled the trigger and Jamie was the lookout. But according to Jamie, it wasn't their fault. Chris asked them to do it. Hey, hey, buddy. Following this confession, the detectives had Jamie call Buddy to get a confession on tape. Oh, fingers. Oh, Jamie, Christmas. You got rid of everything because it's for me, didn't you? Uh -huh. Okay. I make them feel like that. When Buddy was brought in for questioning, he at first denied that he had anything to do with the murders. I'm not going to tell you. I did something I didn't do. But as detectives continued to press him, he eventually caved and admitted everything. Ever since all this started, I've been, I've had my wife threatened. My wife has been threatened. They've threatened to take me out. In an effort to get a full confession, investigators made Buddy call his wife Barbara as they listened in. Barbara. Yeah. Before you find out from somebody else, I want you to know I was involved in it. And I did it. What? Some of it. After this confession, law enforcement officers raided the Potter's home where they seized an arsenal of weapons. Creepily enough, there were also pictures of Bill, Billie Jean, and their friends printed in the family's living room. Talk about obsession. Barbara was caught red-handed ripping up some of the pictures in an attempt to conceal them from investigators. The police also seized other items, including the family computer from the home. In Marvin's truck, the authorities discovered shredded emails. An agent meticulously reconstructed over a hundred of what appeared to be thousands of emails sent to the Potters by the CIA Chris guy warning them that Billy and Billie Jean were plotting to kill Janelle. Important to note, these emails started around the same time Billy and Billie Jean got engaged. How convenient. Right? It appears that there was some type of conspiracy here. They, they, they kept referring to a guy named Chris, uh, that's supposedly a CIA operative or, or something. Going back a little bit, Janelle would tell Jamie about Chris, who she described as a family friend and someone she viewed as a brother and that he worked in the CIA. Janelle even added a Chris Potter as her brother on Facebook. Chris would even post threats to Billy and Billy Jean from Janelle's own account. Yeah. After seeing the online bullying Janelle had gone through, the Chris guy apparently got in touch with Janelle's parents and loyal boyfriend, Jamie, and convinced them that Janelle was in real danger and Billy and Billie Jean had to die. From the emails, Barbara was just as eager, stating that she was 100% behind what happens. Chris got particularly close with Barbara, who said that she thought of him as a son. Yeah a son she had never met or knew anything about other than what he told them via email. How naive, right? Chris even offered to get Marvin a job at the CIA. Mind you, no one had ever met the guy or even talked to him on the phone. All communications were done via email, yet they trusted him completely. 
In the emails, Chris claimed to have surveillance on Billy and Billie Jean, and he had proof that they were plotting on harming Janelle. He urged the parents to do something before it was too late. In one email, Chris informed the parents that he could kill Billy and Billie Jean, but he was out of town on some assignment. It was therefore up to the Potters to go ahead and put Bill and Billie Jean down for good. Chris also communicated with Jamie, telling him no one deserved what Janelle was going through. Anywho, being the overprotective parents they were and feeling they were getting no help from the police, Barbara and Marvin did what would change the Potters' lives forever. Marvin and Jamie broke into Billy and Billie Jean's home and killed them in cold blood. Okay, it was Marvin who did the killing. Jamie apparently just accompanied him. Chris had convinced Barbara to get her husband to commit the murders, which was so easy since Marvin loved guns. But now, here comes the real twist. When investigators traced the IP address of Chris's emails, guess where it traced back to? Yes, the Potter's home computer. Turns out, Chris had been Janelle the entire time. She literally hatfished her own parents and boyfriend and convinced them to kill on her behalf without picking a weapon herself. Wow. Social media allowed Janelle Potter was to be someone that she wasn't. When she invented Chris, she could assume a different identity and be as hateful as she wanted to be. Janelle, her mom Barbara, and her dad were found guilty of double murder and are serving two life sentences. Jamie took a plea deal and got 25 years in prison for his role in the murders. I have a disgustingly innate ability to lie to myself that I've exercised far too many times in my life but I refuse to hurt someone other than myself by doing that. This guy is crying after being accused of violating his former high school girlfriend and then choking her to death with a climbing rope. He then tried to cover up his tracks by cleaning his DNA off of her, but a crime that he had committed three days earlier would bring the police right to his doorstep. But will he admit to his crime? And why did he do it? I can be very uncomfortable. Is there? Because of what you're trying to set you in. And what's that? This is the tragic case of Jessie Blodgett, the teen actress who was found violated and killed by her creepy ex. Nineteen-year-old Jessie Blodgett lived in the small town of Hartford, Wisconsin, with her parents, Buck and Joy. She was described as a brilliant and talented musician with a passion for drama, and was always singing, dancing, and playing the piano. On July 14, 2013, Jessie gave a brilliant performance, playing the Fiddler in the community's production of Fiddler on the Roof. After the performance, she joined her fellow cast and crew members at a pool party to celebrate the success. In this video, you can actually see her at the party, smiling and appearing to have a good time, but something was wrong. When she came home later that night, her mom noticed that something was off and asked her about it. I said, what's going on? She said, oh, the guys, you know, they're always making passes and I don't know why they have to always turn it there. Jessie confided in her mom that two much older men, both in their 40s, had come on to her at the party and that one of them had tried to pull her onto his lap. Although Jessie tried to downplay it, the whole thing really freaked her out that she even wrote in her diary about it later that night saying, I think certain men are taking what should be platonic love and putting it into a competition. I'm not helpless. I will recognize and confront them without fear. God be with me. Chillingly, these would be the last words that she would ever write. The next morning, Jessie's parents went to work and left her peacefully sleeping in her bed. Her mom even checked on her before leaving, and everything seemed fine. However, later at noon when her mom came home for lunch, she was surprised to find Jessie still in bed, so she went to wake her up. But the moment that she touched her, she stepped back in horror and called 911. Second. Okay. Okay, so is she, is she breathing? I don't think 
so no, the pants are all wet and she's got, it looks like circulation marks. There are circulation marks? That's what it looks like. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's going on. The paramedics arrived moments later and tried to save Jesse's life, but it was already too late. Jesse was gone. One of the first investigators to arrive at the scene said that they found Jesse on the floor with obvious ligature marks on her neck, wrists, and ankles. Her hair and sweatpants were wet, suggesting that the killer had spent extra time trying to cover up his tracks. He staged her body. I believed he washed her body and then placed it back in the bed, covered her up. Oddly, there were no signs of forced entry and everything in the house was intact, meaning the killer was actually someone who knew Jesse. But who would want her dead? The first suspects that Jesse's parents thought of were the two men who had harassed their daughter at the pool party the previous night. Could they have followed her home and waited until she was alone in the house to attack her? Investigators brought one of the men in for questioning, and although he admitted to playfully joking around at the party, he claimed that there was nothing more to it. Investigators looked into the man, but they couldn't find anything to link him to the crime scene, so he was ruled out as a suspect. The second man who had reportedly told an inappropriate joke was also cleared, as he had a strong alibi about his whereabouts when the crime happened. So who actually killed Jesse and why? The answer to this would shock everyone in the community. Meanwhile, as this was going on, police in a nearby town of Richfield were investigating another crime that had happened at a local park. These two cases would come to link up in a very interesting way. On July 12th, three days before Jesse was murdered, a woman named Melissa was walking her dog when she heard someone sneaking up behind her. So I looked back and I laughed and said, oh, you scared me just because I thought he was some friendly guy. And then I turn around again because I can hear him coming at me and I see a knife in his hand. The guy tried to attack Melissa with a knife, but she was able to fight him off and grab the knife from him. The next thing I remember, I'm on the ground, he's on top of me, I'm stomach down, I'm holding on to the knife, he was right for it. I had blade. Melissa later gave a detailed description of the attacker, saying that he was a white male, 18 to 20 years of age, 6'2", and 210 pounds. He had light blonde hair and fair skin, and was driving a dark blue Dodge Caravan minivan. Interestingly, when this detailed description was released, one deputy who regularly patrolled the park remembered seeing a similar vehicle in the parking lot several weeks before the attack. For some reason, he decided to run the vehicle's plate and found that it was registered to a middle-aged couple in Hartford. The couple happened to have a 19-year-old son by the name of Daniel Bartlett, who matched the exact description that Melissa had given about her attacker. When the police called him, they were shocked to learn he was at Jesse Blodgett's home. What was he doing there? And how did he know Jesse? Those who knew Daniel described him as a funny, outgoing person who was kind and caring towards others. He was always really in a good mood when I was around him. He was always joking around. I mean, if there was any like violence, it was just messing around. Daniel and Jesse had known each other since high school and had even dated for a short while before deciding to just be friends. Daniel shared Jesse's love for music and the two had even recorded a song together. After Jesse's death, Daniel seemed completely devastated and spent most of the time at her home comforting her parents. He was at her vigil, telling everyone about the wonderful times that he shared with Jesse when the police called. Then all of a sudden he was he had this phone call and I just kind of looked at him when he got this phone call and he wasn't like upset, he wasn't surprised, uh, and he just said, oh, okay, I'll be right over there. And then he hung up the phone. Investigators' initial motive when they brought Daniel in for questioning was to find out if he was the guy that had attacked Melissa in the park. But they couldn't ignore the fact that he was from a vigil for a woman who had just been murdered. Where, uh, where were you at again? I was uh, uh, in uh, Hartford, just about house. The girl that just passed? Yeah, you were visiting her And I said, you know, just making small talk, what, whatever happened with her? And he said, 
What's weird about this answer was that the police at the time did not know that Jesse had been assaulted. So how did Daniel know that? At first, Daniel denied having anything to do with Melissa's attack. But when he learned that Melissa had identified him, he caved and admitted everything. You went after that girl, right? Yes. Okay. Why? What were you going to do? I'm scared. Daniel told detectives that he had dropped out of college and felt scared about his future. So apparently he wanted someone else to feel the same way. But could he have killed Jesse? Even with the incident at the park, everyone who knew Daniel, including Jesse's parents, did not believe that he was capable of hurting Jesse. How could he? He was a great kid from a nice family and was one of Jesse's closest friends. What reason would he have to kill her? He had everything going for him. He was a top-notch student, straight-A student. He got the lead role in most of the musicals, very talented. I was like, I like this kid, you know, just because, you know, he could make me laugh. And he came from a nice family. As it turns out, they were wrong about him. In the interrogation, Daniel insisted through tears that he loved Jesse and would never hurt her. He told investigators that on the day of the murder, he was at Woodlawn Park, where he was captured on surveillance cameras. Investigators instinctively went to the park and started searching the trash cans. And what they found was super suspicion. Inside one of the trash cans, they found a cereal box that contained a rope, antiseptic wipes, and red stained paper towels. The rope matched the ligature marks found on Jesse's neck and would later test positive for both Daniel's and Jesse's DNA. But that's not all. When they checked Daniel's laptop, they found a disturbing search history about serial killers bondage, and strangulation. He had also spent several hours watching a violent adult film with a plot similar to Jesse's murder. And like that's not enough, investigators learned that Daniel was writing a novel titled Red is Red, in which a girl named Jessica is violently murdered by a character named D. Hmm, not sus at all. Daniel's DNA would later be found underneath Jesse's fingernails, and his fluids would be found inside her, proving that he had, in fact, violated Jesse before killing her. With all this evidence against him, Daniel was arrested and charged with first degree murder. During the trial, prosecutors argued that Daniel snuck in through Jesse's bedroom window, hogtied her, gagged her, and then violated her before taking her to death. He then tried to wash his DNA off her body and put her back into bed, making it appear as if she was asleep. Jesse's screaming to us. She's screaming to us. She's telling us a story. His DNA is all under her fingernails, under, under her left hand, under her right hand. The prosecutor the prosecution theorized that Daniel's reason for killing Jesse was just to fulfill his dark desires. He had tried targeting a random woman, Melissa, but failed, so he chose a much easier target, someone who knew and trusted him, and unfortunately that person was Jesse. But get this, despite everything pointing to him, Daniel still maintained that he was innocent. I have a disgustingly innate ability to lie to myself that I have exercised far too many times in my life, but I refuse to hurt someone other than myself by doing that. Luckily, the jury didn't believe him, and he was found guilty and sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole for Jesse's murder and five years for the attack on Melissa. When Dan murdered Jesse. He killed not just who she was, but who she would become. She will never have the chance to be that woman. And I will never have the chance to know and love and admire and take pride in that woman. What do you think about this case? Let me know your thoughts down in the comment section. And if you liked this video, be sure to like and subscribe for more.